You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. Today, I'd like to remind you that there is a website called wealthformula.com that you simply cannot ignore. It is a site full of resources, including uh, a free download of my book, Seven Secrets of Eternal Wealth, which you may want to get for yourself. You can also get it by simply texting 44222 and typing in Wealth Formula. That's one word. The event, the Dallas event is coming up. It might be sold out, The uh, Wealth 2.0. I'm not sure exactly when this is going to air, so I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, if you're interested in our meetup in Dallas, September 27th and 28th, go check it out at wealthformulaevents.com. Uh, Tom Wheelwright's going to be there. Uh, we got Doug Ludmel, uh, Dave Steele, Damian Lupo, a bunch of smart guys. Uh, and and um, actually, my wife is going to be there too. So if you want to meet my wife, that's another reason to come out. September 27th, 28th, go to wealthformulaevents.com. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about today's show. So, you know, the truth of the matter is, and I've said this before, I'm sort of a simple guy, you know. Uh, I I need things kind of simple for me to understand them. And when I do things, I do them very simply. When I bowl, I throw it right down the middle of the lane, right? It doesn't really make sense to me to try to put spin on a ball. If I can just put it down the lane in the middle and try to hit the middle pin and make everything fall down. So that's how I feel about it logically. And the reality is that even if I wanted to put spin on it, I wouldn't know how. So uh, I should say that I am a pretty decent bowler. Um, I had one game one time where I had seven strikes in a row in the first seven frames. Um, it was, uh, and then everybody in the entire bowling alley was watching me. This was when I was like 17 years old, by the way. And the next ball was a gutter ball. So finished that game was a 237. Uh, not bad. I'm usually bowling probably closer to like 130 though. I'm not, you know, it's not like I bowl very often. I bowl maybe once or twice a year and, and that was just a crazy lucky game, but it was all from bowling down the middle. When I tell people that though, that I'm a simple guy, that I need things simple, uh, they think I'm joking about that, that I'm being like somewhat like, you know, Hey, you get, dude, you're, you used to be, I'm wearing, didn't you used to be a brain surgeon or something like that? Didn't you, didn't you, you do all sorts of different kinds of surgery? How can you call yourself simple? The reality is I am telling the truth. I am telling the truth and surgeons will tell you all the same that when we do things the same way every time over and over, it's really not any different than anybody else doing anything else. Um, you know, I learn things the way, uh, I, I learn things as the, uh, the learn things the same way no matter what. And for me, that's a matter of connecting uh, point A to point B. I mean, sometimes there may be a series of point A to point B, but if I can't connect all those dots, I'm never going to understand it. Uh, now, on the converse side of that, one thing that I'm real good at doing is that if I do understand it, I'm pretty good at explaining it. I'm really good at dumbing things down because that's kind of the way I think. Um and so even if things are complex, usually you can break them down into simple things and understand them. But I'll tell you one thing, I really don't like complexity because the reality is that too many moving parts mean too many chances for error, too many places where people can screw up, too many places where someone, something drops the ball. So whenever something looks a little different uh, to me, it looks a little bit more complex well, it makes me nervous. Uh, by the way, I should say that it's not, you know, it, that that what we're talking about today is not necessarily a topic that is just complex. Uh, it's something I don't understand, which is agriculture. Agricultural investing, on the other hand, is one of those things that I don't know about because, well, I just don't really understand it. I, I mean, I, I guess people have to eat, so I know that much about it, but it's not like I really understand how it works. Um, particularly, say, investing in agriculture overseas. I mean, I've done it before, um, investing overseas. Uh, I would probably never to do, do it again. Um, I like predictability. And, you know, people say a lot of negative stuff about the U.S. Here's entire, you, you know, newsletters and stuff telling people, hey, you should, you know, get another passport and have an exit plan. Damn, if, if the U.S. is in trouble... 
the U.S. is in trouble. There's not going to be any place to hide. I'm sorry. That's just ridiculous to me. But um, when it comes to the U.S., I, you can say this, regardless how, of how negative you are about it, um, it's still a land ruled by law and government. And it's, it, it is, a, is a land, it is a country that will never be overthrown or at least any time in my lifetime will be overthrown by some sort of foreign uh, government that suddenly changes all the rules. Um, and if someone screws you over here, there's a pretty good chance that you might be getting retribution because we have a court of law, laws that you can actually enforce. Now, if you don't have that on your side, uh, good luck to you. That said, you know, I'm saying all this, but I'm also open-minded. So I talk to people about things that I don't understand, uh, things that I feel inherently a little bit uncomfortable about. After all, there was a time, a long, long time ago, uh, that even though my dad did multifamily real estate, I didn't really understand it. I had an inherent comfort with it because it was that multifamily real estate that sent me through college and medical school. I won't lie. He paid for everything education-wise, and it was just, uh, it's hard to look at, you know, that and feel uncomfortable with it after all that, uh, after the last four, uh, you know, four decades or so. Now, um, I will add when it comes to multifamily real estate, uh, you're talking to somebody who's pretty much bet his life in this asset class at this point. Um, and while there are many uncertainties in life uh, that do make me uneasy, to be quite honest, these investments don't make me very uneasy. There's a lot of things in life that make me a lot more worried than my investments in multifamily because I know where my money is. I know who's managing it and who is in control, who the operators are. And I feel good about it. I really do. But, you know, again, uh, you want to go out there and get other people's opinions. Living in a bubble is not good for anyone. Uh, and as I've said before, I make an effort to constantly listen to new things uh, and I will also admit that on many occasions have changed my mind. Uh, you've heard me on the show over the course of the last, I don't know, what is it, about three years since we started the show, where I flip-flopped on things. I've said, oh, I used to say this, and I used to talk about this, and all of a sudden you say this, and you're like, listen to 100 shows later, what is this guy saying now? This is totally different from what you used to say. Well, it's because I listen to people. I learn things. I'm dynamic, uh, dynamic in terms of my, um, my learning you know, and I'm constantly trying to improve my own investing philosophy. And I think that's important for everyone. Anyway, um, so something different. That's what this week's show is about. Uh, it is about agricultural investing in Paraguay. And when we come back, we will have a man by the name of David Smith to tell us all about it. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest and Wealth Formula podcast is David Smith, uh, who is an agricultural advisor at Paraguay AG Invest. David, welcome to Wealth Formula podcast. Well, thank you very much, Buck. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share the information that I have with your listeners. Thank you very Good. much. Good. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start out, first of all, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're not from South America. How'd you get interested in the agricultural space and ultimately end up uh, down in Paraguay? Well, um, initially, um, I got involved in real estate uh, sales and development in Latin America. At one time, I lived in Nicaragua and I opened up the first Remax franchise in Nicaragua back in the early 2000s. Okay, so I... Mm -hmm. I had a previous career uh, with uh, Panasonic company, the Japanese electronics company worldwide. And after I decided I wanted to uh, get out of the corporate world a little bit and do something different, I came to Latin America. And very shortly, I found myself involved in uh, real estate. Got it. Yeah. And why, so, so why, why real estate in, in, uh, you know, in uh, outside of the U S why, why, why real estate in, in, uh, Panama or Nicaragua or, or Paraguay? Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting question because it wasn't planned. Mm -hmm. uh, it just happened to be that, you know, uh, when I lived, when I went to Nicaragua, which was the late nineties, uh, there were very few, uh, tourists there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
is basically a country that was recovering from, of course, you know, the, the Sandinista Wars with the Contras and so forth. But it was beginning to open up slowly but surely. So over a period of time, when tourism started becoming more popular, I had uh, primarily North American and Canadian tourists, uh, you know, you know, approaching me and saying, hey, David, you know, do you know anything about property here in Nicaragua? I'm, I'm looking for a beachfront lot or I'm looking for a colonial home, you know. Right. And, uh, and so it just evolved over a couple of years into a real estate franchise. Sure. That's how I got involved. Yeah. So how do you go from real estate, a real estate franchise, to um, then getting involved in the agricultural business? Uh, well, again, it was a little bit unplanned, but, uh, but not actually, because uh, when I decided to move to Panama uh, 10 years ago, I also continued, you know, with my involvement in residential real estate, you know, condominiums and things like that. Uh, but a very good friend of mine who's a very savvy uh, financial consultant and investor himself uh, would remind me periodically that agriculture is a very good diversification. Mm -hmm. okay? And he said, look, you know, you need to protect yourself a little bit from the markets. You need to try to, you know, have a little alternative uh, uh, and, you know, portfolio in things that are not bubbled, which, you know, as we all know, uh, residential real estate and commercial real estate can be. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, began to take his advice. And then when I decided to liquidate my real estate holdings in Nicaragua, uh, I thought, well, that's a good time to explore and look around and, and see what's available. And so initially, I invested in uh, an agricultural project here in Panama. And that entails uh, organic avocados and mangoes and things like that. And uh, once I got involved in it, uh, when I understood the business model, you know, of it being a uh, basically a private placement with a hard asset, I like that. And uh, so the company that I, I actually invested with asked me if I'd like to work with them because of my many years of involvement in, in real estate in Latin America. Got it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So if, if you have, uh, if a listener has no experience, um, or exposure to let's start with the general concept of agricultural investments, you talked about, you know, I guess, uh, um, some lack of mar market correlation, but what, what's the case for investing in, in agriculture? Well, agriculture, as we all know, uh, is the production of food. And uh, that's a basic human, re human requirement. And the demand is constantly increasing, of course, uh, you know, due to the increase in the human population in the world. Uh, other factors are the disappearing arable land that's available around uh, most countries, especially the most uh, uh, productive countries like the United States. And from a financial point of view, uh, it's, a, it's a good hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. And actually, as I mentioned before, um, it doesn't, uh, doesn't really uh, have any correlation with the stock market or with uh, bubbles involved in other types of real estate investments. Right. Although it has its own inherent risks. Is that right? Well, certainly. Yeah, no, there's, there's certainly, uh, you know, there's almost no investment, as we know, that doesn't have a risk. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so you, you have a risk of, I, I suppose, at the end of the day, there could be a massive price drop yeah. in food for, for whatever reason. You know, I mean, um, nothing's impossible these days, but I think that's probably the most unlikely well, let's uh, talk risk. about some yeah. of the things, other things that I think would be um, useful because this is a, you know, it's it's not a straightforward, you know, investment. Um, let, this specifically, now we're talking about something that's overseas, which on its surface may sound, um, you know, might sound sexy to some people. and and But isn't mm -hmm. there some additional risk when you're dealing with countries outside of the U.S., dealing with their laws, dealing with their regulations? Well, certainly, yes. And I think that uh, this is an important part of the due diligence process. Mm -hmm. I, I think that anyone uh, who's, who's seriously interested in making this kind of investment uh, needs to ask the very questions like, you know, what are the laws? What are my rights? What are the risks? Uh, you know, legally, uh, besides the fact that there are obviously 
um, natural uh, risk, you know, of, of, of rain or, or hurricanes and different things like that. But uh, as far as investing in other countries, you, you really need to do good homework. And I think that whoever you, you talk to, whether it's me or any other agricultural advisor, uh, you need to ask uh, specific questions about the country itself. And what are the laws? What are my rights? What are the conditions for title? And things like this. This is very important. These are the same questions that I asked myself when I came to Nicaragua a long time ago. Well, and yeah, and to that point, I mean, part of what I'm trying to get at is, you know, you just mentioned coming to Nicaragua a long time ago. You also have to look at, um, you know, political stability of a country, right? Just because sure. you know the, the, the regulations and the laws today doesn't mean they're going to be the same tomorrow. Uh, and that's so right. that's, a, that's another issue. Uh, and how about in terms of, um, you know, the, the, what specific sort of uh, types of things does a U.S. investor need to know when it comes to things like, you know, taxes, any sort of tariffs or whatever, um, you know, special forms that would need to be filled out if you own or invest outside of the U.S. in Paraguay? What, what, I mean, are those types of things, uh, you know, are they fairly straightforward? What, what kinds of things do people deal with? Well, um, in, in many cases, Buck, they are straightforward. Uh, a, a lot of it depends on what exactly is the, the motivation of the investor. And, and what I mean by that, uh, some investors, if they buy, let's say they buy a lot of oranges from me, uh, they may very well title that lot in their own name. However, there are other investors, um, one might say a little more sophisticated that use entities such as offshore LLCs. Uh, perhaps they use an LLC in the United States, you know, Delaware or, mm -hmm. or Nevada and things like that. And in that case, uh, it becomes uh, just a little bit more complicated because they have to create the entity and then they need to uh, decide uh, how they want to receive any disbursements, okay? Now, regarding taxes uh, in the United States, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, for example, we create a financial statement at the end of the year, and we provide our clients with that, especially the North American clients, uh, generally early January, so that they have that information for their tax accountant to, to do their taxes in April. Now, uh, the, the format that we've been seeing is that it's actually, surprisingly, the, uh, the requirement by the RRS is, is pretty simple at face value. You declare the income that you've made uh, from this investment overseas. You also declare how much tax you've paid, and then the IRS will calculate what taxes they would charge on this kind of income. And for example, if you're paying in Paraguay, the income tax is 10% on income. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the uh, IRS is, is charging 15% on this type, type of income, then you would get a credit on the 10 and you would pay the five to the IRS. This has been sort of the standard procedure uh, Got it. as far as IRS. So presumably However, we're talking about ordinary income here. Um, with no, ordinary. you know, ordinary income, there's no significant tax benefits to this kind of uh, investment. Is that right? Like in, with other types of real estate? No, no, yeah. there's not. Got it. Okay. So um, let's talk about the specific opportunities you have. One of them involves uh, some oranges. You want to talk about, tell us a little bit, sort of the, uh, you know, high level on, on, on how that works. Well, you know, we have a very, uh, very interesting business plan with regards to what we grow and what we sell. Um, what I mean by that is uh, most of the other agricultural projects that I know of in Latin America are primarily focused on the export market. Uh, with regards to my mangoes and avocados here in Panama, uh, the vast majority of them are exported. However, in Paraguay, um, Mr. Karsten Pfau, who is the owner of Agriteric AG and has lived in uh, Paraguay for about 30 years, um, he has basically focused on the import markets in Paraguay. And 
that means in Paraguay, about 85% of all of the orange products that are consumed in the country are imported. Okay. And so you mean, you mean people who are consuming oranges within Paraguay? They're primarily imported. They're not grown in Paraguay. Got it. That's what I mean. I mean, there, there are some plantations, we being one of them, but uh, the vast majority of the produce, whether it's orange juice or whole oranges or pulp and things like okay. that, which is used, it's, it's all imported. So, so Karsten has focused on competing against the, the imports in Paraguay. So after a, after a vast, vast study of what it takes to, to implement this kind of program, he realized that, okay, this is a long-term type of investment because Paraguay, uh, you know, most people, some people know that Paraguay is a, is a big agricultural powerhouse in Latin America, but the power of the agriculture in Paraguay lies in two sectors. One is cattle and the other is row crops, such as soybean, things like that. They don't really focus on citrus and things. They import all that mostly from, from Brazil, if you will. Why don't they grow it there? Is there something about the land that makes it less? I mean, if it's, you know, is it just not naturally grown there? Or is it, I mean, I well, mean, it's grown there on a very low level, but it's more than anything. It's just a matter of tradition. Okay. They've just traditionally been that because, I mean, they have massive farms. They're, I think Paraguay is a, maybe the fourth or fifth largest exporter of soybean in the world. Mm-hmm. And corn and chia wheat and things like that, you know, and these are products that, you know, the turnover, once you plant them is within five to six months. But in the case of an orange tree, you need to invest in the trees and all of the crop care for four years before you get a return. Mm. Okay. So, so Mm -hmm. this is a, this is a different process. So uh, traditionally in Paraguay, this has not been done because the, the, uh, the restaurants and the supermarkets and things like that, they, they buy them mainly from Brazil. So Carson's idea was, how can I compete and make money against the imported produce? And he's put together a pretty good system, which is based upon, of course, lower land cost, lower electricity, labor cost, and he can compete quite, quite well against them. So in this scenario, the market that you're after or to sell these oranges is local. It's, it's not. All local. It's all local. So the do people pay as much for an orange in Paraguay as they do in the U.S. or other countries that you that you would otherwise possibly export to? Uh, I think they pay more in the United States, but uh, there's no way that a, a small operation uh, like ours could compete with Brazil, for example. Sure, Brazil, sure. Brazil is the largest grower of citrus in the world. So how, how big is your operation or how small, how many people involved? Well, currently right now we have a little over 1,400 acres mm-hmm. of orange and different citrus trees. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty small, right? So 1,400 total. 1,400 okay. acres, yeah. We've got others. I mean, we, we have more land that we've already purchased. This is the, We will never stop planting orange trees. Mm-hmm. We'll never stop doing that. So uh, it's a question of, and this is an operation that's only been in, in business for four years. You okay. know, we just paid out our first returns, you know, just this year. So it's an ongoing process. We will, I mean, Con, Karsten is constantly buying more land to, to keep growing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a long-term investment, but now we've got, um, you know, we've got about 115,000 trees in the ground mm-hmm. and, uh, by years in prop, well, not years in, uh, early, the first quarter of 2020, uh, we'll have about 205,000 trees in the ground. So the model that you have for a uh, potential investor is to, as I understand it, to buy real estate, um, and buy these, uh, you know, buy, buy parcels of land with orange trees on them. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the, the, the business model is comprised of two parts. The first part is a simple real estate transaction. 
So that means you purchase the land and the land is uh, titled in your name, fee simple title, with all the rights that you'd have in the United States or here in Panama where I live. Uh, the second part is the farming service agreement. And basically what you do as an investor, uh, you make an agreement with the farming company to manage your investment, your land and your trees for the term of the contract. Uh, in that case, in, with oranges, it's 25 years, okay? So basically, uh, once this uh, agreement has been signed and the investment has been funded, then begins the implementation of the saplings and the trees, and they, they basically do everything, including um, harvesting and selling. Uh, you pay the, the tax at the end of the year, and the net profit then is a return to the investor. Um, so this, this uh, company or this operator that, that does that, that relationship, how do you know that that relationship is stable for 25 years. I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm looking at this as an investor, you know, and, and these are the kinds of questions that come in my head. It seems like there's this moving part of this relationship that's required with an operator overseas. Um, can you kind of describe the nature of that relationship? Well, the, uh, Agriterra uh, SA, mm -hmm. which is the South American uh, company of Agriterra KG, which happens to be a German company, uh, they are the operator. Mm -hmm. okay. they, How long I mean, have they been around? As as long as Carson's been there, they've been around twenty five oh. years. Yeah, okay. yeah. So they've they, I mean they've done other projects as well, different types of mm -hmm. things. But the farming company is a part of Agriterra KG. That's why the the agreement uh, is basically signed, and the agreement is under jurisdiction of. German law because it's a German company. Okay. So okay. in order for, for Karsten to offer this kind of investment in Germany, the jurisdiction must be in Germany. And uh, an added feature, which I think is very important to mention, which is which provides a, a high level of security for the investor, is the fact that because of the German jurisdiction and the requirements in Germany, the company, the Agriterra KG in Germany must provide insurance on the investment. So the, the investment is insured two ways. One, against financial embezzlement, and number two, against natural disaster. Okay, right. so this is, this is really a, a very important uh, element in, in, in what we offer there because I, I can assure you, uh, I don't know of any other agricultural investment where it's insured against these types of uh, issues. Right. And, and that's, so the German coverage, insurance coverage would extend to U.S. investors. That's right? correct. To everyone. That's correct. Now, yeah. and, and presumably that, um, that operator um, relationship is, is basically some kind of percentage of production. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. But going back to your original question about 25 years, if I may address that, mm -hmm. um, you see, the, the actual farming company, because Carson is the owner of the farming company, it, it is a family-owned business. And they themselves own approximately 40% of all of the orange trees and all of the land themselves. Mm -hmm. So their idea, in, in order to become really big, you have to, by scale, invite a lot of people to come in and invest in orange uh, in the orange plantation so that you can plant the trees quickly. Okay, so what I mean by that is Carson has a lot of personal equity in the projects. Mm -hmm. This is not all just investors' money. Sure. A large portion of it belongs to Carson and his brother, who are the owners of the company. Got it. And But uh, as I understood it, though, that this this particular project was only there for about four years. So... The 25 years is referring to the how long the operator has been doing this kind of thing, but not necessarily in Paraguay. Is that right? Uh, yes. It's, it's, they've been doing it primarily in Paraguay, right. the, the actual uh, farming company, 
although Agriterra SA has been involved in, in many things in Paraguay for 25 years, re residential, commercial construction, things like that. Got it. Um, so you mentioned uh, you know, a period of time, I think four years, you buy a plot of land and you're effectively, you're not going to make anything for four years or. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then three and a half years, more or less. Yeah. And then after that four years, then what? Well, what happens then is you see when you, when you invest uh, initially in the lot, if I can, I can give you just a overall mm -hmm. overview sure. of the numbers. Uh, if you buy uh, our smallest lot, which is uh, six tenths of an acre, that investment is $19,500. That includes not only the purchase of the land, but also all of the expenses for crop care and operating costs through the time of the three and a half years up until you can actually receive a harvest and receive an income, you see. So, because there's a lot of things to be done to citrus fruit you know, all the time. Now, once after four years, once you begin to uh, actually produce the oranges and receive your ROI, then the investment becomes, it, it, it basically pays for all of the costs going forward. Mm -hmm. So there's no more, there's, what I'm saying is the initial investment is the only investment that you need to make. It will then pay for itself. It'll pay for all the operating costs. Yep. And everything going forward. Understood. And, and, um, you know, the, the whole period, presumably if you don't, uh, um, if you, you could sell presumably at some point, but let, let's talk, Looney is going to start making money at around four years. Do you have some kind of a projection, presumably like on a 10 year pro forma or something like that? What, what kinds of yields are you projecting for people who buy this stuff? Or if you, I don't know if you do those, I presume you do. Oh yeah, of course, of course we do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in all of our brochures, we have a, a ROI spreadsheets mm -hmm. that are, that are set up for 25 years that, that outlines uh, all of the costs going forward, you know, such as the, well, actually we, we can forecast uh, how much fruit will be harvested on the lot. Mm -hmm. okay. It starts there. And then you have your operating cost and then the management fee, which is, uh, which is quite reasonable, which is only 5%. Mm-hmm. And then you have your pre-tax harvest proceeds, uh, your tax, and then the net ROI payment to the investor. Uh, to give you an idea of the annual ROIs, in year four, when you first receive a small uh, harvest, uh, the return's about 11%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, up in, because you have to understand that the trees are growing, and basically citrus fruits, uh, I'm sorry, citrus trees, they grow in a curve of maximum production mm -hmm. and this, the curve starts going down. Okay. okay. So we're starting from 11 and we're peaking in year 20, I'm sorry, 13, 14 and 15. There you're up around 26, 27% annual ROI. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, it'll go down to 23, 20, 2019, and then ultimately in year 24, about 16 uh, yeah. percent. And, so, then, and then what happens is uh, in year 25, all of the trees are removed, they're cut down, and they're sold for very valuable firewood <laughs> in Paraguay mm -hmm. because of the forestation controls there. And then you begin the whole process over again. Right. So it's a generational investment. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Do you so when you calculate that? Do you have like an IRR or only if you sure we have up? an IRR as well? I mean the the IRR over the term is uh, almost fifteen percent. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about um, the other project. While I have you, I don't. I want to make sure we at least touch on it. The greenhouse project. Can you give us sort of a high level? On that one? Yeah, well, the greenhouse, um, this, is, this is also very interesting because, again, it's focused on the local market. Mm -hmm. Everything is, is that we grow in these greenhouses, which happen to be um, cucumbers, tomatoes, red and yellow peppers, is sold on the Paraguay market. 
the main reason for that is obviously these are some of the ingredients that are used in almost every meal in, in Paraguay. That's at some point in the day. Um, now, in the case of vegetables, the climate in Paraguay is not conducive to growing these types of vegetables. Mm -hmm. They are done. It is sold, but very low level demand, very low end product. And again, uh, the supermarkets, the restaurants, uh, many of the food distributors, they import these products from Argentina. Okay, so they're imported and they're quite expensive as well. So this is another uh, uh, focus on competing against the importers, which, which we can do quite well. Now, in the case of the greenhouses, uh, this is a much more straightforward uh, investment in terms of uh, returns. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is the, the greenhouse is a substantial investment. If you want to own an entire greenhouse and the land, it's $320,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the land is approximately 1.23 acres and the greenhouse is half that size. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the return on that is within 12 months of funding the investment. So what that means is once the investor funds, we place the order, we receive the greenhouse in about two months to two and a half months. We build it, we plant it. And within five months after that, you have to, you have the first return. Do you have a sense again of sort of a pro forma type thing in there as well? Oh yes. Yeah. And, and, uh, we also base the, the forecast on current information that we receive from the Ministry of Agriculture in Paraguay that gives us wholesale pricing curves. So we, we know exactly what we're projecting. Uh, however, Karsten tends to lean toward the conservative side. Mm -hmm. So I would say on our, on our orange projections, he could be anywhere between 30 and 20% a, a little more conservative than the, than the numbers that are actually out there. With, in the case of the vegetables, he's a little bit closer. He's about five to 10% mm -hmm. below what these numbers indicate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you look at year one, the, the net income uh, to the investor is 16.11%. And in, in dollars, that's about a little over $51,000 the first year. How long does, now, how long does a greenhouse last? Well, the greenhouse structurally can last, uh, if it's maintained properly 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's maintained. Uh, one important note though, uh, when I mentioned this first year number on the ROI, uh, you will notice that there's no income tax for the first four years of income. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is the government of Paraguay, has offered an incentive for people to invest in greenhouses. Right. So there's no income tax in Paraguay, but there's, you know, I'm sure the U S oh, certainly. Yeah. In the United States. Sure. Right. So all you're doing there is replacing the U S income tax with the Paraguay income tax. That's correct. So, so that's what, the, that's what they're doing there on their right. end. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And then uh, the, the term of the contract on the greenhouses is 10 years. Okay, and there's a, a very good reason for that. Um, in a greenhouse operation, this is not a hydroponic greenhouse or anything like that. They, it's, a, it's a regular uh, organic type greenhouse. The components that are used, heavily used in a greenhouse like this happen to be cooling compressors, the irrigation system, lighting and things like that. And uh, so what has to happen then after the end of 10 years, we bring in uh, an evaluation team from the, uh, it's basically an Israeli company located in Brazil. They come in and they make an evaluation on what components need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, we've determined that the amount that you would spend after 10 years on renovating the greenhouse is somewhere between 45 and $50,000 to get it back up to spec. Okay. Huh? So, 
Once that is completed, then we will sign another 10 year contract. So the, the costs, um, you're, when you're giving projections in terms of the income that's coming off of those, does it include the costs of the, the greenhouse? Um, I mean, is that net operating income that's coming off or is that gross income or what? That's, that's net. That's net. Okay, to got it. Got that's it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's, now we do not, we do not, uh, forecast the the renovation cost or anything like that uh that's that's basically left up to the investor however what's very important to note here about the greenhouse is if at the end of 10 years for some reason the investor decides not to proceed with the renovation then he must sell the greenhouse got it we cannot have an inoperative greenhouse sitting there we have to be because we have we have 50 of these Mm-hmm. So it's very important. Got it. So, um, all right. Well, good. Is there what else? What else uh, do you think we need to know uh, before we uh, before we close this out? I want to make sure you have an opportunity to tell us anything else we might have missed. Well, I think um, it's it's important to note that you know uh, investors are looking for I think more security uh, in in the times that we're living in right now. You know, I think the. Uh, the stock market is going to be severely tested here shortly. <laughs> and uh, I think that people uh, understand that, you know, real estate markets go up and down. This is nothing new. Mm-hmm. And if you would like to diversify your portfolio, um, I think agriculture is a very, very important part of that. It, 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 uh, we feel that if you do good diligence, do really good due diligence, uh, many of the people come to Paraguay. We offer uh, tours from time to time. We offer private tours. Sometimes we, we advertise them. Uh, I suggest uh, come down and see it for yourself. You know, meet the company, meet the operators. You know, and I, what usually happens is this. Uh, if someone wants to go, um, they will meet me here in Panama City, where I live. And then I will accompany them down to Paraguay. Okay, and then we we we'll spend two or three days there, and they can see the entire operation. They can they can meet uh, you know Karsten Fowl, who is the owner of the company, and I think they'll be very impressed uh, with the professionalism of the operation. And I think once the, they understand what we're doing and they see what we're doing, uh, they'll realize that it's it's a pretty secure investment. It really is. Great. Um, well, listen. Uh, how how can we learn more? Uh, you can go to our website, which is www.paraguayaginvest.com. And there you will see many videos, photos. There's a lot of information. We've got a lot of testimonials there about our our current uh, investors. Uh, There's a lot of information on our website and you can download uh, the brochures. And then uh, if you would like to have uh, a consultation with me, just send me an email at david at paraguayaginvest.com. And, and we usually respond within a day or two. And um, yeah, and then we can also provide you with other information like uh, the insurance coverage. Uh, we can also send uh, an executive summary as well, if you will. Great. So there's, there's a lot of information available. Excellent. David, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks uh, very much for being on Wealth Formula Podcast. Well, great. Thank you so much, Buck. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. And I, and I, I want to thank uh, Michael Flight for making this possible. You bet. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Um, as you know, uh, I've said repeatedly on this show before, just because I have someone on, it does not mean that I'm supporting a particular investment or that I am investing in it myself. We do these shows edu- as educational purposes, and this is really important because uh, I have had people who I've talked to later on, maybe on an investor club call or something, that said, you know, that thing that you were talking about that you liked, you know, a couple years ago. And I'm like, I didn't say I liked it. I just had the guy on because I didn't know anything about it. So listen, I, I am not advocating for this. I know very little about this investment, but it was really something just for learning. Uh, It's an opportunity um, to learn about something interesting. But, you know, based on that, I think it is important 
uh, that since uh, David talked about the relative merits of this kind of uh, this kind of investment, to kind of look at it critically, because I think you can't have these types of situations where it's not really a conversation. And whereas I, you know, I have no no particular opinion about you know what what he's doing. It could be the greatest things as sliced bread. I think it's important to examine it and start looking at any investment the same way. And you can do that by very simply sort of picking things apart and asking basic questions like where, why, when, you know, how, things like that. So um so let's let's start with that those kinds of questions. Well let's start with who. Uh well who are they? Um, I don't know them, so I can't say that I like or trust them, right? Because, you know, no like and trust is a good place to start. I haven't done a bunch of due diligence with them. Uh, they've only been doing this for four years in Paraguay. That was something that I noted. Uh, is that enough time for a project that may last for decades? Do you feel like that's okay for an operator that you're going to potentially be uh, working with for 25 years um, that's a long time, right? So the who is a big question you have to get your head around. I mean, I've only um, been married to my wife for 12 years. Um, I trust her, but I've, you know, I've lived with her for, you know, 10 years now, and uh, she seems to be just fine. But 12, you know, 25, 30 years, I think, uh, I think for anybody to get into an investment like that, you better know them well. So I think he offered up the opportunity to go out and visit them. If you're really thinking about this kind of thing and you have a conversation, that would be something I would highly suggest. So after who, what? Okay, it's agriculture. Agriculture. Agriculture, I guess, is good, you can say, right? People do need to eat oranges. People have been eating oranges for a awful long time, and they'll keep doing it. Um, but waiting for orange trees to grow. Uh, that makes me a little uneasy. So they said it, you know, it takes four years for oranges to grow. Uh, I, just for context, in our investor club syndications for multifamily real estate, you know, we expect full capital return by the end of four years. Um, and, and so four years is a long time. I mean, I know we're waiting for trees to grow here, but it makes me think, how do we even know that it'll only take four years? I mean, while I understand the lack of correlation of the markets, and that's a good thing, nature has its own lack of predictability. And and then there's that whole issue of, well, you know, climate change, and I won't even go there. So, uh, again, I'm not trying to say this is not a good thing to do. I'm just saying these are the questions you need to ask. Where? Well, they're operating out of Paraguay. What do you know about Paraguay? I don't know anything about Paraguay. For me, that's not comfortable that I don't know about Paraguay. It doesn't mean I can't go out and learn about it if this is something that's really interesting, but I don't know the laws. I don't know anything about the politics. I mean, you know, we were talking about Nicaragua and the Sandinistas. I don't know, I don't know if there's anything like that around there in, in, in Paraguay. Um, you know, I'm sure David and, and, and his team are uh, honest and good people as well. But if someone, the other thing to consider about you know, these sort of foreign investments is that, you know, you got to trust somebody enough because if somebody screws you over in South America, good luck trying to recover your money. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's just the reality. It's not going to happen. I mean, that's why people set up offshore bank accounts, offshore trusts and things like that so that they have protection in the, in case of, of getting sued. And I know there was a German insurance policy for fraud and we talked about that. Well, maybe that helps, but again, that's something you're going to want to look very, very closely at as you consider this. And part of that question may be, well, what exactly does it cover? And does it cover you as an American or, or a Canadian? I know we have some Canadians too. Uh, so those are the types of things that I would look at. Why is the next question. Who, what, when, where, why, you know, that kind of thing. So why? Well, again, the, the answer may be agriculture is thought to be low risk. And you heard David say that he thought this was a low risk investment. But in the context of an overseas investment with a group that has been doing something for four years, does that potentially uh, negate the low risk uh, element of this? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But um, I certainly uh, would not say that at this point in my due diligence, I would call this a low risk opportunity, but you have to decide for yourself. When? Well, the when question. Again, I'm not interested in personally in investments that last for decades, uh, especially in ones that last for decades in which there's no liquidity, uh, unless you may be forced to sell and you're forcing to sell in a situation in a foreign country where you don't know anything about the real estate laws. So that's you know, 
that is a is something to to think about. You may feel differently. Um, you know, I also believe in this concept of velocity. You know, at this play, time in my life, I'm trying to grow wealth quickly. So within five years, frankly, my rule of thumb is I want my money back at least once by that time and redeployed somewhere else. Um, and one could argue that with things like this, with agriculture in general, and they're extremely low risk, uh, blah, 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 that you, you know, you can go the long haul and not worry about it um, because they're so low risk. Uh, but the, you know, I mean, I think before you get to that point, particularly, you know, just from this conversation, we're not even close to finishing a due diligence that would uh, say that this is extremely low risk. And, uh, you know, having a an investment that lasts for decades uh, would be something that may be uh, something you may want to consider. Um, now, listen, I'm not dogging on David. That's not my point. I just think it's really important when somebody comes on with an investment opportunity to look things critically. And also, and from my end, honestly, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want anybody to say that I, I said to invest in this because that that's what has happened in the past. Um, and uh, sometimes when people come on and, and they are promoting what they're doing, it's, uh, I think it's part of my job to make sure that I ask hard questions. And I think that's what we did. And I think David was a good sport about it. Uh, he told you the merits of, of what he th- believed to be uh, regarding these opportunities. Um, and, I, and I would encourage you to go back and, and look at the same questions that I'm asking if you're interested. And if you do end up moving forward, just make sure you feel comfortable with all the issues that I brought up. Anyway, uh, that's it for me this week on uh, Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.